this afternoon's uh, talk, we've got um, Andrew Collier, who is uh, uh, known to all of us, I think. Um, he's uh, a long-standing U3A uh, member, uh, convener of history and philosophy. And um, those are sort of two groups I go to. Um, I suppose this sort of fits a little bit into philosophy. It's um, one of the perhaps least successful groups of um, U3A, we've been at it for 20 years and we haven't come to an answer for anything yet. So um, well, there we are. Um, so no further ado, um, Andrew, please. Thank you. Thank you for coming. There are two things to say by way of introduction. The first is that I'm really no expert, but various circumstances in my life pointed me towards this. So I have tried to find out a little bit more about the topics which we are going to be covering. And the second is that it's a ridiculously huge topic to try and get through in uh, anything like less than a fortnight. So if you like to get your beds ready, we'll give it a start. Right. If I can get the machinery right. Ah. There, right. We're doing the history of religion and trying, and basically this is a sort of a couple of warm-ups. Basically, the function of religion, there are, I promised various philosophers that there would be a list, and it had already been written. These are the sort of, almost since man has been able to speak and become a bit different from the animals, it seems that there have been religions. And why have there been religions? There is a suggested list of reasons. To explain and answer the big questions. To explain the way things are. And then, various points in life, you need to know what to do about them. At birth, for instance. I mean, this is a hatch, match and dispatch questions. And at the biggest, in terms of needing some sort of guidance is probably the dispatch. What do you do with the body of your relatives? Or even what do you do with the body of your victims? It brings in all sorts of possible superstitions. Even without religion, decisions have to be made on those questions. Then religion has been used to guide our behavior. There are plenty of people around today who say, well, where would we ha how can you have morality without religion? There are all sorts of answers to that. But religion is, and as soon as we have moral issues, we turn to our archbishops and get them on the telly. The standard answer to an issue is to get a, the relevant vicar on the box. Then, and this is the nastier bit probably, but it's inescapable, you cannot escape from the fact that religion has been used. It helps us to organize society, and that may be positive. It also plays into the hands of those people in power. And you can't get very far without recognizing that as a fact. And then the largest, or at least the one that one has to say, it is just possible that the reason we have religion is that it's something like the truth. The problem with that is that there are so many different truths that you might have to decide. It's almost like the world we live in, in the world of Donald Trump. There are a lot of different truths available. Um, just on the right there on that chart, if you've worked your way through the left-hand side, the right-hand side just speaks for itself. Christian, Christianity, by far the biggest religion, although we, there are one or two things that we haven't included there. The study of other religions was not something we should expect in a church dominant. Basically, throughout history, throughout recent history, Europe in particular, has been dominated by the Christian church. One might say, really, by the Catholic church. So looking at other religions was not something that was encouraged or done. The church had a monopoly of just about all our thinking. It had a monopoly of our educational institutions. All our universities were church establishments originally. 
all our schools were run by monks and so on and so forth. So the church had almost total control. It began to happen a bit in the 19th century. And in particular, as it says there, the German Religionsgeschichtliche Schule, that's religion and history school, was preeminent in beginning to investigate other religions. But it was doing so not because of an interest in religion, but in an interest in other cultures and other societies. This is sociology taking off, and we were interested in what they believed. And what they believed obviously helped to shape their society and so on and so forth. So it was a sociological rather than a religious interest in the first case. And always, as far as the other religions were concerned, it was very condescending. They were, after all, all pagans and barbarians. And we condescendingly would try and find out what they believed because it might help to explain how we could help to exploit and conquer or whatever else you would do. How we could help them, perhaps, depending on your point of view. But anyway, the initial interest in other religions was there in that guise. And then... If you're reading that, you, classifications arose such as the priestly, the proselytizing, the circumcising and the non-circumcising, the substance taking, the cannibalistic and so on, these various different religions. And all of them obviously were complete rubbish except our own, but it was interesting to learn about them because of what it told us about those people. Obviously, the rites and organization structures, scriptures and artifacts became a study in themselves. So, in order not to threaten the one true faith, they were always disguised as sociology or anthropology or whatever it was. And then finally, this is roughly what I said in the newsletter, for those of us who grew up, most of us here, grew up, and at school we had RE or divinity or scripture or whatever it was, and you did a little bit of Old Testament and a little bit of New Testament, and it's important to understand that this is no longer the case. At the end of this, I hope you will have learnt a few things that you didn't know before. The probability is that your grandchildren do know far more about them than you do. Because if you try teaching history in schools today, it is actually very difficult to get past the fact that half your kids think that a Catholic is not a Christian, and the other half think a Protestant isn't a Christian let alone knowing who Joseph of Arimathea is, let alone knowing the difference between Joseph and his many coat, cut coat of many colours and Joseph the carpenter, the dodgy father. So, that's onwards. Back to earliest, there are several various uh, sorts of religion which did hold sway. One of them, which may be due to a man-dominated world, but the idea of God as a mother, the mother God. And one of those is the oldest known religious, I think it's the second one, the oldest known religious artifact that you could come across moving forward. So the worship of, and if you're looking, going back to my initial question about why we have it, to solve for mysteries, one of the biggest mysteries, one of the most wonderful events in anybody's life is the delivery via a lady of you know, the biggest miracle in ordinary human life probably involves those forms. But it didn't have to be a lady. It could be, depending where you lived, it could be one of the animals. That bottom picture I mean, the others are fairly ancient. The bottom two pictures, actually, are genuine religious activities still active in the world today. Bear worship and the spiritual magic of snakes are still believed in in some places. When you look at other religions, it is different, difficult to separate what people actually believe and what they regard as myth. And if you find that complicated with other religions, just have a look at, if you are 
a good old-fashioned Christian, just have a look at the difference between the bits you actually believe and the bits that you are prepared to say, ah, that's just a story. I doubt, I may be wrong, but I doubt if there are many in this room who actually believe the Adam and Eve story. It's just a myth. Or, anyway, one of the complications as we go forward is to both get the difference and understand that other people have to make that distinction. There's evidence. Most of that evidence is actually about the dispatch bit of my hatch match and dispatch equation. Most of the artifacts which show us that there's been religion around in the world for millions of years are, or for thousands of years, are to do with death, burial rites, mass burials, individual burials, excarnation. If you haven't come across excarnation, that means taking the flesh off the bones before you inter or do whatever you're going to do with it. Mummification, laying out, cremation, funerary gifts and grave markings. The historical evidence for earlier religions is chiefly of that sort. Then it is clear that many, and probably historically, most of the religions had lots of different gods. A god for this aspect of your life, a god for that aspect of your life. The fertility gods, the hunting gods, the farming gods, and so on. And you've got, you've got up there, you've got the Egyptians, you've got the Norse, you've got Romans and Greeks. And until the next slide, most religions have had a number of gods. The earliest of the world's big religions is this one. As I was looking at that, the 4,000 years BC is spurious and sort of not much, you can't find the evidence particularly, but the stories, some of the stories, went back that far. By about 500 BC, those stories were coming together as one village met another and explained how, what they believed, and they sort of began to share, and it began to geel into one sort of faith. But it's still, even now, anybody who's got involved in the Indian religions will tell you that there are differences, regional differences, even differences between one village and another. Um, a brief summary there. Brahman, the universal spirit, the life force, the ultimate reality, the idea that all life forms have a soul. Just as you look at this, what's in common with the other religions that you know about? Aiming for the purity of oneness with him. Trying to get... Then you have karma. One of the things everybody knows about Hinduism is they believe in reincarnation. It's easy to find and devise jokes about reincarnation. But the idea of making a comeback in a different form is part of it. And then karma, your behavior, your behavior influencing your future. It's not very different from the religions we do know. Lots of gods, especially the big three, Brahma the creator, Vishnu the preserver, Siva the destroyer, and lots more little gods and local gods and avatars, people who were once human. Bottom left, a good Hindu is going to have his own little shrine in his bedroom. Still on uh, Hinduism, the scriptures, the Vedas, the hymns and prayers, the Upanishads, the caste system, household shrines I've just mentioned, and vegetarianism, and sacred cows, and sacred threads and rituals, all that. Difficult to get it as one religion because of the different variations between areas and villages and so on. But there is a common thread to it. And of course, it's got lots of gods. It's still polytheistic. Polytheistic, but with a holding together around the Brahmins.
Still around, this is religion with magic mushrooms or religion with whatever other uh, influences you can have in a state of a ritual trance. The word devised by anthropologists studying the Asian religions and it's still practiced. These, there are variations on this around the world where people under the influence of whatever drug it is that they're taking are seen to have a contact with something spiritual outside themselves being guided by forces, bigger forces than we know. And then we come to the first, well, the unifying idea of the big religions, the one God. There we have it, from Adam and Eve through to Abraham, and it, this sort of belief that there is one God is prevails between the three, the big three, the big three, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. Just a little note at the bottom, the pharaohs, or this particular pharaoh, Akhenaten, tried and really got it done in for a, a brief interlude of trying to persuade the Egyptians that there was but one God. A brief little interlude, he, his reign came to a, a bad end because he was failing to persuade them to get away from their multi-gods. More monotheism. This is very early. This is a thousand years before. And it's... <laughs> some of it started a thousand years before. Some of it's seven, in the 700s alongside Cyrus and Darius, the Persians, who initially beat the Greeks and then were beaten up by Alexander the Great. So Zoroastrianism, based really in Persia, one God, the wise Lord, a supreme being. Do the right thing. Do the right thing. Why do the right thing? Because you're frightened of God? Or do the right thing because it is the right thing? Quite a deep, I mean, Zoroastrianism, is not widely practiced, but it has been hugely influential on the other religions. There's a lot of thinking behind the Zoroastrianism. The path of truth is good thoughts, good words, and good deeds. You know, the, these, Martin Luther would have recognized that little list. It still has followers, and it is widely respected as a philosophy, and it has influenced the other faiths. Then we get going. So Abraham, we, the start of monotheism, also the start of Judaism. Just a little bit about Judaism. The first, I expect most of you know this, but basically the first five books of our Old Testament plus the Psalms amount roughly to the Hebrew Bible, the Talmud. The Talmud kept sacred in the Ark. And to other little bits where excerpts and reminders of the importance of a Talmud on the door frame of a Jewish household or in the little box, the tefillin on the arm or the forehead. Traditions there, the Sabbath, circumcision, bar mitzvah, yamulka, the skull cap, kosher food, no pork, no shellfish, synagogues and rabbis, and there are their fe some of their main festivals. Just to give, give it some historical context, Abraham to Moses is roughly 1800 to 1400 before the Christian era. The kings are a thousand to seven hundred or so before the Christian era. David's reign is usually dated around about there, 1010 BC to 970-ish. A lot of the prophets in the 700s. Then you have the various exiles, the Jews, exiles, 
the Jews being dispersed around the world to different places is an old, old story. Before Christ, you have a Babylonian and a Persian and a Hellenistic exile. You have a Maccabean revolt. Then in Roman times, you have another diaspora. And throughout time, as the chosen people, perhaps, anyway, they have retained their identity. In spite of pogroms and the Holocaust, they have retained their identity. You will recognize the next three different groups or families of, of uh, Jews, the Samaritans, the Pharisees, the Levites, all mentioned back, into, back to school, back to your RE, and you knew those names. You were less aware, unless you were deeply into the history, of the other Jewish communities around the world. Ashkenazis in Central Europe, the Sephardis in Port Spain and Portugal, the Mizrahi in the in, uh, Middle East, and of course, it is still, I think, probably true that there are more Jews in New York than there are in Israel. Orthodox Jews, conservative Jews, reform Jews, even humanist Jews, Jews who don't believe in God, but retain their Jewish identity. Confucius. I said that the Jewish bits can go back a couple of thousand BC. This goes back 500 odd BC. Confucius, source of lots of jokes. Confucius him say, what him say? Him be philosopher, not God. It's a way of life. It's not meant to be a religion. And this is when I said about the distinction between myths and beliefs. There's this other distinction between a religion and a way of life. It's not what you believe or the way that you conduct your life. And Confucianism has certainly been part of a way that people conduct their lives. with a strong emphasis on the family. Veneration of your ancestors, respect of your elders, and, I'm so sorry girls, respect for your husbands. This is a model for society. At the bottom there, when I was more Christian convinced than I am now, I thought one of the wonders of Jesus' thinking was do unto others. As, and I learn now that the golden rule is present in most of the religions and thinkings of the world. The, that's the, the Confucian statement of it. Do not do to others what you do not want done to yourself. It's just a variation. And the golden rule is prevalent through most of the major religions and most major thinkings in the world. Taoism, another one which isn't really necessarily so much a religion, but highly influential. Tao is the way. It was there 400 odd years before Jesus. It was there in earlier Chinese, the shaman traditions, the shaman or shaman traditions. So you could, you could get a bit of Taoism if you did your mushrooms or found some other substance which would help to give you power. Uh, the school of naturalists, yin yang, there's the yin yang symbol the balance between our behavior and natural cycles. All of these things heavily influential in China and still, despite what has happened politically in China, a lot of people still heavily under these influences. More philosophy than faith, it tends to emphasize the Wu Wei, effortless action, naturalness, Simplicity, spontaneity, and the three treasures. The three treasures, compassion, frugality, and humility. Then, still before Christianity, 500 odd years before our deadline BCE, before the Christian era, Prince Gautama, 
Buddha, the Buddha. He's not God. Nobody believes he is God. They believe that he was the person who had these revelations. He saw the sadnesses of life in particular. I mean, the story is that under his Bodhi tree, he discovered, he saw the misery of human existence. He's a prince, he's privileged. But he saw old age, he saw disease, he saw poverty and death. And he abandoned his palace, he gave up his rich life, adopted an ascetic life and learned meditation. Under his tree, he adopted or discovered the Four Noble Truths. Life is full of suffering. This is caused by worldly ambition or greed or all the material things that we are aware of still. To end these worldly desires, you should adopt the Eightfold Path, which comes up in a moment. And if you adopt it well enough, you may achieve Nirvana, the enlightenment, the enlightenment which extinguishes the fires of desire, the fires of hatred and ignorance, and which keep the cycle of suffering and rebirth going. The Eightfold Path, the Eightfold Path sounds horribly glib when you just do the eight folds. It's right belief, right aims, right speech, right conduct, right occupation, right thinking and concentration. If you were to be trying to, if you're sitting under your tree, you can work through that list and see if you've got it right. Uh, and it, it's, as I say, it's easy to sound glib about it, but it contains some useful thinking. There is no God in Buddhism, but lots of cults, lots of shrines and temples, and the great emperor Ashoka in a 300 and something BC, 232, so two or three hundred years before our era, Ashoka helped Buddhism to spread and advance throughout Central Asia. Hmm. What it says at the top, I don't, I don't know what, I, nothing I can do about that. Jesus, the word Christ means the anointed or the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, I'm going to assume that you know most of these things, but I'm just going to run through it and trying to put some history behind it, get some dates into it. The incarnation, it, that's the life of Christ. It, it, scholars generally now agree, don't ask me for this, but basically your Archbishop of Canterbury and most of the people in the Vatican would accept that these dates are something like the reality. And that means that Jesus was probably born in 4 AD and that Jesus' life, you then say the boy in the, in the temple and the carpenter and so on, takes you through to 29 AD when he started on his mission. It's generally accepted that Jesus is spent, having spent a, a wonderful childhood and uh, early years, early manhood, his mission to save the world was about three years long and lasted from something like 29 to 32. Then you can list the things that happened. You start with the disciples, you do the preaching and teaching, you bring in the miracles and the healing, and then you go through the awfulness of the arrest, the trial, the crucifixion, and then you have the wonderful bits of the resurrection, the ascension, and on to eternity. Then there's some other little dates there. These are real, established, accepted dates. James was martyred in 44. Paul's, St. Paul's journeys around the Mediterranean, from which he wrote the epistles, are generally speaking from 49 through the 50s AD, 50 years after Jesus was born. This is historic fact. The Council of Jerusalem in 50 AD. The epistles themselves finally get to be published or retained, put, set down in the 60s. Paul was martyred in 67, Peter in 68. 
Thomas in India in 72. These are quite difficult dates to put together with the rest of the story. The Gospels were written, Mark, the first of the Gospels, generally accepted, supposedly dictated the story as told by Peter to Mark in 68 to 70 AD. Matthew, 80 to 90. Luke, who also wrote the Acts, between 86 and 90. John, 90 to 110. And then these are almost indisputable facts which help to put those other dates in context of your history. Augustus's reign was 27 BC to 14. You will be hearing the passage which says in the reign of Caesar Augustus a few times in the next few weeks, most of you. In the reign of Caesar Augustus. Pontius Pilate is a historical figure from 26 to 36 in power in Jerusalem. Caiaphas is a priest from 1830, uh, from 18 to 36 AD. Tiberius reigned from 14 to 37. In 49 AD, Claudius expelled the Jews. In 64, Nero played his violin and got in a mess. Carrying on, just we, there's a few of the ideas. I suppose I put those ideas up there because those of us who sort of were brought up in this haven't necessarily looked at what the, the implications of these ideas. When you hear about one of the other religions, you get given these new ideas. Now look at the religion which we were brought up with. You have the idea of the Holy Trinity, the idea of the Immaculate Conception, the idea of the Messiah, the idea of resurrection, the idea of confession and forgiveness of sins, life after death, faith and good works. Those things, various of them, part of other religions. When you look at the other religions, they seem odd. Now put yourself in the position of one of the other religions and looking at the Christian religion. Then these are some of the words which your grandchildren probably don't know and fully understand. Catholicism, the idea that Catholic actually means everybody. The idea that gentle Gentiles are outsiders. The idea of the Eucharist. We're back to confession. The communion of saints, an idea which most of us here will have been brought up with. Uh, the apostolic succession, then these big events, Christmas, Epiphany, Lent, Good Friday and Easter, Ascension Sunday, Ascension Day, the idea of things, Sunday is a special day, the idea of Mary and the saints, baptism, confirmation, and back. To, now, back to my history. Those are just ideas which look at them from the outsider's point of view, and they take on a slightly different interest. The vision of Constantine. Constantine made Christianity the religion of the Roman Empire, which made one hell of a difference to the survival of Christianity. Now, he did that because of a vision, because he won a battle, because he was the emperor but he was also a politician, and it was, he was playing at power games. Council of Nicaea set the Bible in 325. It also adopted the Nicene Creed, which some of us have recited more than a few times. Saint Jerome, Saint Augustine of Hippo, there are your dates. The actual making it the official religion, as opposed to the emperor's approved religion, is 380. Then we can move a little bit closer to home. St. David in the 550s. Pope Gregory sending Augustine to Canterbury in 596. Having been brought up in Canterbury, as far as I am concerned, that is when Christianity arrived in... But note, David was earlier. And in this corner, and in Ireland, 
There were at least areas of Christianity much earlier. Synod of Whitby, 664. Charlemagne, Holy Roman Emperor, 800. The Great Schism, the split between the Roman Catholic and the Orthodox Church, 1054. Well, you know another date, only a little bit removed from 1054, if you want to get, because it's one of the things I do in history, is help people to get a context of the history they do know with the history that they don't know. Well, this is probably the history that we don't know, but 1054, that great schism, is 12 years before William came and to Hastings and all that. The Crusades. We had wonderful talks about the Crusades in the history group uh, only a few months ago. 1095 through to 1291. Resumed by George Bush. 2003, 4. St. Francis and St. Thomas Aquinas in the 1200s. The schism between the popes, or the popes, what's it called? The, the pope left Rome and went to Avignon from 309 to 1377. Uh, nice big divide. And we had three popes in three different places briefly in those dates. Then you get the Gutenberg Bible, what a difference that makes. We now have printed Bibles. Instead of every Bible being handwritten, and therefore not too many of them, and there being an absolute treasure, you now have a Bible available to anybody who can afford a printed document. St. Peter's starts, St. Peter's in Rome starts in the 1470s. Of course, the building of St. Peter's in Rome causes some of the fundraising, which causes some of the difficulty in selling the indulgences, and the selling of the indulgences is going to upset a man called Luther as we get there. Uh, the Spanish Inquisition officially started in 1478. It came to be pushed a lot harder with uh, Charles V and Philip of Spain and, uh, and so on, but it was officially the idea of the persecution of heretics starts in 1478. We also have trouble in Florence when Savonarola upsets everybody and we have the burning of the books, um, the bonfire of the vanities uh, and the reassertion of, I suppose, almost a humanist interpretation from the Medicis and that aspect of um, the Renaissance. 1521, Luther was at the Diet of Worms. He pinned up his documents. We had the anniversary this year, so it must have been 1517 that he put his uh, theses on the door of Worms. Not Worms, of, uh, where did he put his? Wittenberg. Witten Wittenberg, yeah, on the doors of Wittenberg Cathedral. The Tyndale Bible. 26, 1526, 1534, don't play around too much with my idea that politics and power are part of religion, but um, this gentleman wanted to get rid of his wife and it had a bit of an impact. So Cranmer is becoming the archbishop and is going to manage 20 odd years of change in the 1540s, parallel with that, Calvin is getting going in Geneva. And in reaction to all this change, Ignatius Loyola is launching the Jesuits as the Catholic fight back, the so-called Counter-Reformation, which has wonderful implications for art, uh, not quite such happy implications for those people who get on the wrong side of it. Bloody Mary, 1553 to 58. Then we return to Elizabeth. Elizabeth's 39 articles, still at the front of the prayer book in 1563. In the 1570s, Presbyterianism is taking off in Scotland with, I think it's John Knox on the, or is that Cal? I'm failing to recognize my own pictures. You have Luther, I think that's Knox. 
Then you have Bunyan and Wesley, Newman and F uh, the Fox, the Quaker. So let's just go back to my, my list. The King James Bible, the official Bible, the only Bible for 300 odd years. The King James Bible, 1611, drawn up by a committee with the wonderful Shakespearean language which they've had trouble replacing ever since. 1618 to 38, the 30, 48 mistake. Somebody tell me off. 1618 to 1648, the Thirty Years' War. An absolute horror if you were living in Central Europe at the time. 1620, a little group of Christians in this country escape, get away from it all, get away from the persecution and try and start something new, the Mayflower. 1648, it's the end of the Thirty Years' War, and Fox is getting the Quakers underway. 1649 to 60 is the Oliver, Cro Cro Oliver Cromwell and the Commonwealth, and in 1678, Bunyan is writing Pilgrim's Progress. In the 1740s to the 1760s, we have the Wesley's standard A-level essay, Did Religious Revival of the Wesley's Avert a Revolution? The idea that it was better to be poor, you could have a rough time here and go to heaven from it. Religion, the opium of the masses. The evangelical revival, that is people like Shaftesbury and Wilberforce and others reviving, trying to clean up religion and take it away from being the, uh, the priority of the second son to become the vicar with a, a nice living and try and get some religion back into context. The evangelical revival. And then in the 1830s and 40s, we have the Oxford movement, again, reviving, trying to revive a church which has become so establishment that it's in danger of going under. And it is at that sort of time that you go to Lourdes and Bernadette and those miracles. You have the origin of species. That's a bit of a challenge. 1859. And the idea that the churches, the divided churches, should be coming back together begins to take off. Right, we get away from that, and that's made a few people uncomfortable, but uh, those questions need to be thought about, I think. Now we can go and look at another religion. This one only started 600 odd years after the Christian era got going. Islam. It means the surrender. The word means surrender to Allah, the one God. Muhammad is only the prophet. That's their big statement. There is one God, Allah. Muhammad is his prophet. Muhammad is actually only the last and the greatest of the prophets. Other prophets whom is Muslims believe in are Abraham, Moses, and the others from our Old Testament, and Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is a good prophet. He's just not the prophet, which is Muhammad. He received his message from the angel Gabriel. It was dictated to him and written down. He came down and had it written down in the Quran later. It outlined the right path, the surrender to Allah. And then it becomes a little more political and military. Muhammad moves from Mecca to Medina. He builds up a following. He meets resistance. He marches with 10,000 followers to capture, recapture Mecca and to set up the Kaaba, the black, the black uh, inside that black canopy is the Kaaba, the holy stone which has had a holiness attached to it for hundreds of years already in Mecca, a meeting point of all the journeys going across Arabia. 
the a base where, anyway, Mohammed himself is an affluent tradesman. Arabia is increasingly under political and religious control. As so, by the time he dies, it has become his area. His area has swallowed his beliefs. Sorry, I don't know what happened there. I must have pressed for too long. We've had that one. That's where we should. Have we had that one? No. Right. There is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. This is the five pillars. Faith. The first one. Prayer five times a day. Face Mecca. Your carpet, your Muslim carpet, will point you towards Mecca. If you're in the wrong place, you can lay your carpet and point it towards Mecca and kneel on it, pointing towards Mecca. Giving of alms. The tax is almost like a tithe. There's a percentage of your income should be given to good causes. Fasting, especially the fast of Ramadan, the strict one, the sunrise to sunset every day throughout Ramadan, and also the regulations of what you're not allowed. No pork, no alcohol, no smoking. The last one, the pilgrimage, you ought to try to get to Mecca. Uh, pilgrimage is not quite as strange. I mean, pilgrimage is part of many, most religions. have got their pilgrimage places. Bear that in mind. A minaret, the call to prayer, the muezzin from the tower, the qibla. Every um, mosque has its little corner f to tell you which way is facing Mecca. If you've not been in a mosque, you must be prepared to take your shoes off, but you can see these features. And you won't see many women in most mosques. This, it, it spread, of course it spread, it spread throughout North Africa. It spread into Europe, both ends. I've mentioned Spain there, but of course it came in through Turkey and into the Balkans and in the Middle East and into India. And the first of many schisms, schism was the one between Ali and Abu Bakr, between the Sunni and the Shias. And it's still around today, and an awful lot of Middle Eastern politics. I'm not claiming that I can understand Middle Eastern politics. If you meet anybody who can, then they'd be worth hearing and, meet and uh, talking to. But underlying an awful lot of the complications of Middle Eastern politics is this schism, this divide between the Sunnis and the Shias. Just looking at that map, the greeny ones are the majority, the Sunnis, the greeny through to the blue, the yellows through to the red are the Shias. But actually, when you get in there closer, the, the numbers become a little bit different when you think about the power behind Iran and the yellow and red places on that map. Shinto. We had a very interesting talk right here a few months ago by a lady who knew and had lived in Japan. And what she described was all these traditions, not so much a, a belief, not so much a religion, but an acceptance of the ideas as a way of life. I found that really quite interesting because as we move away from church membership and Sorry, I'm very, I do come across as being very negative from a Christian point of view. I don't really mean to. But if we are moving away, then there are bits of uh, the way of life which are associated with the church, which some of us would like to hang on to. If you don't have faith, what do you do with Remembrance Day? What do you do with some of the events? And 
the Japanese have managed to incorporate some of the faith into their way of life in a way which I think is quite interesting. Uh, there's a little list anyway. The original, if we say that it's 7 to 800 AD that most of this started, it's building on Buddhist roots. It's taking up old traditions. The idea of lots of, there are eight, what does that say, 85,000 shrines and priests throughout Japan and the Shinto believing areas. Until 1945, the emperor was held to be a god and is still, even after all that happened, still has a sort of a religious role and a religious feel. Lots of sects, lots of different attitudes and so on and so forth. 80% of Japanese follow Shinto tradition, often in a non-religious way, but seeing it as part of their national identity. Sikhism, a much more recent, started in the Punjab in the 1520s with Guru Nanak Singh. There were then a succession of other gurus. It became quite a power base uh, by 1799 to 1849 or so, there's a Sikh empire which was brought to an end by the Anglo-Sikh wars, a little uh, part of the history of India. The spread, we have another diaspora, just like the Jews going around the world. There are Sikhs in Canada, in Africa, in th this country, obviously, in the Middle East, and around the east coast of America. Sikhs who went away from the Punjab. They're one of the, their scripture is called a, is called a guru, like the, but it's actually a book. And the, the ideas of selfless service, the idea of justice for everybody, the idea of one world. The admiration of honesty, use of meditation on oneness, and doing things in the name of God, in God's name. No alcohol, no haircut, no halal meat, a liturgy without priests. And at the bottom there you have the Golden Temple, which has seen its share of troubles. There's, is that a religion or isn't it? It's what some people believe. I must get your portrait before I do this next. <laughs> Just to, the chap on the left is, uh, no, I've, I've never heard of him. Hol, Holberg, anybody know this? Holmberg, something like that. He's a, a, a French aristocrat, you can see he's a French aristocrat but he actually declared himself an atheist and, and propounded some atheist ideas at a time when it was not a, bra not a particularly wise thing to do. Uh, then you have David Hume, whose th thinking was clearly uh, atheistic, although he didn't make too much, again, he didn't allow himself to get into trouble on it. There are various philosophers whose philosophies were trimmed. I don't think it's fair to say that David Hume's was trimmed to avoid getting into trouble but he didn't get into trouble. That's Shelley, who, had he lived longer, would undoubtedly have got himself into trouble because he quite liked getting into trouble. He's a, a troublemaker. Um, there's a bottom right, the big one, there's a man called Karl Marx you may have heard of. And another famous one is the God Delusion Man, Richard Dawkins, now I suppose the champion of atheists in this country at the moment. Going back to the history and trying to put a bit more together just to bring it to an end, in the 1790s, during the early stages of the French Revolution, they devised their own calendar, Canada, calendar sorry, the revolutionary calendar. They had their own months, they had their own dates, and so it was briefly the age of reason, or reason took over. In 1791, the freedom of religion became 
a well a, a demand a, a constitutional feature of the new America. This is George Washington. The America, United States of America, is just getting going, and part of their Bill of Rights, the first ten items after the Constitution, the first ten uh, amendments, freedom of religion. In 1830, we have the Mormons taking off, and in 1863, we have the Seventh-day Adventists. 1879, Christian science. 1952, Scientology. I got a picture of a Scientologist. No, I haven't got a Scientologist up there. I'm very sorry. Somebody give me Tom Cruise or one of the other ones. And uh, we then have spiritualism, and we have evangelists. I have got an evangelist. I noticed uh, Billy Graham is approaching his... He had his birthday last week and he was well down his 90s, or was it 100? Anyway, Billy Graham is now an old man, you'd be surprised to know. Uh, 1917, the Russian Revolution brought in state atheism. The cathedrals... I, when I went to Russia in 1966, I went into a couple of the biggest cathedrals around, and one of them had become the pendulum which, which proved that the earth was going round the world. The dome was a wonderful place, but I mean, it was not a religious institution. It was a communist, atheistic institution with a little bit of science being part of its tourist display. The Scopes Trial. That is, in America, putting on trial somebody who believed in evolution. The 1930, Rastafarianism took off. In the 1960s, there are serious movements towards getting the church together. Ecumenicism is becoming very serious. We are introducing women priests, and we are dealing with both the liberalization and the scandalization of various church issues. So those are part of what we... And then we have the Palestinian, Palestine Liberation Organization, Al-Qaeda, and ISIS. And at that point, I hope I have given everybody something to think about. A very brief history and quite a lot of ideas, maybe more ideas than one can cope with in one dose, but something to think about. And I find out that I have taken about an hour. So. <laughs> Do you want this? Hello. All right. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, excellent talk, that. Are there any questions for Andrew? Don't expect me to be able to answer them, but. <laughs> Nicaea, 300, sorry. Yes. Nicaea Creed. A lady just come to our church in Turkey, and um, are now a Christian. I said, where did you come from? Oh, I, I, my home is Nicaea. Of all the places. Yeah. Um, Seventeen hundred years ago, when uh, yep. the church was sorted out, and she said, oh, it's very pleasant there. I think Constantine liked it. It was nice warm there, coming from the sea, and all the bishops came there. As a world, as a world, the, the, the what you're supposed to believe as a Christian was sort of finalised and brought together, and the creed is is a summary of that. And, yep. I think Charles. Charles. Was, this will be a difficult one. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's a remarkably easy one. Right. Uh, I, brilliant uh, uh, exposition of uh, all the various different kinds of religion. I'm just wondering where you see the future going? Uh, a sort of dolly mix mixture of different religions feeding into each other or, or what? I mean, clearly uh, religion seems to address a basic human need, uh, but it, it, it displays itself in various ways. Uh, have you got a view about where religion is going or where various religions are going, whether there is a, a, a process whereby they're coming together in some sort of way 
or drifting apart or getting more conflictual uh, situations or what? The future, in other words. I, do I have a vision for the future of religion? I don't know. I'm just going back. I'm very scared about that bit. And any, anybody who isn't scared about that bit hasn't been, doesn't watch the news as often as I do. And I always wish at the end of the news that I hadn't watched it. But uh, there we are, and it's addictive, isn't it? Um, so the other half of that, having drawn attention to well, ISIS and so on, is there in the disunity and the doubt and the prevailing atheism or agnosticism of today, is there a will to, strong enough to resist? In that whose name are we going to resist ISIS? Because uh, it ain't Donald Trump, I don't think. Um, so do I have a view otherwise? I actually have a sort of a sentimental view, as I said when we were doing, I quite admire what the Japanese have done with a religion that they no longer believe in, or an awful lot of them don't believe in, the way that they have turned that into a sort of a, a national common ground. And there are bits of our heritage which I would like to find ways of clinging on to. Um, I'm afraid I don't believe that the our generation of Christian belief is actually going to get, get any stronger unless some miracle happens. I don't think, you know, I think we're, that is in trouble. And to replace it, I would love. You think, you look at the list and the ideas that I've been playing around with and the common ground between them and the wisdom behind them. And I'd love to find a way that it was all going to come together. I think this may be the moment. I mean. I think I'm allowed to say this. As you probably know, for the last two or three years, we have had a series of evening talks in the summer. And next summer's evening talks, I'm going to revive something that we did in philosophy, but invited everybody to a few years ago. I'm going to invite representatives of the main faiths to come and give us a talk. So we will have, I hope, they were very good talks that we had then in philosophy. This is back in the days up at the rest. And we had our representative of each of the religions. One of the things that was quite interesting in that series was that we learnt that the word pagan, which to me had previously been a word of scorn for people who believed barbaric, that there is some serious thinking. The pagan representative was one of the ones who took us by surprise by having something to say which gave us some wisdom, gave us some good ideas. There's nothing to me, and basically my rector in my last home before we came down to Port of Call invited people, especially we had a Buddhist talk and so on, within the context of the Christian church which I was then attending. So there's nothing totally anti or demoralizing about picking up and picking the brains of representatives of other religions. And I hope that I, let me encourage you. Let me do a little bit of advertising. Next summer's evening talks will be on these lines. Sorry, done the advertising. Any more questions? <laughs> Let's Perhaps there is a bit of hope. You've got the Chuckle Brothers there. Well, when you think of it, no surrender. Paisley <laughs> versus... I mean, those two, uh, an ex-IRA I -A man and a very hard yep. evangelist, hard, hard right, and they got together, so perhaps there is a bit of hope. I, I never thought Paisley would have... Inspired, inspired you to hope. Yes. <laughs> right. There's, there's our answer then, Charles. The answer is that we should sit down and talk. And then call in Tony Blair. Or, or, or. <laughs> and John was going to kill me. The only, the only point I was going to make really is that I, I cannot understand the increase in intolerance in the world. It means that everybody who has their own religion is so committed to the faith in that particular religion 
that they're absolutely certain they are right and everybody else is wrong. And we used to seem to have a much greater degree of tolerance years ago, other than certain specific areas, but with increasing uh, education and communication, I would have thought there would have been a lot more tolerance in the world and we seem to be going the other way. Would you like to comment on that? I think the people who devised Facebook and the, the, the internet and so on had the same belief and at the moment some of the evidence is against them. The more sharing we have, the more the ignorant and opinionated and the slightly anonymous. But uh, I mean, basically in our part of the world, we don't make so much fuss about our religious differences. Certainly in this country and in most of Europe, there is religious toleration, but uh, internet toleration, Brexit toleration, uh, etc. We have become more and more nasty to each other, partly at least, I think, because we can do it secure behind the anonymity of a desk and the, the ether. I don't know. I have no, no real answers. I told you I wouldn't have any answers to the questions, but do try and come along for the evening talks in the summer. <laughs> Are there any other questions for Andrew? I hope I've given you something to think about. Okay. Uh, it only remains to me to um, thank Andrew very, very much for that. That was a fascinating talk. Um, there's so much uh, depth in this and so many... Um, different religions, given that Andrew's really sort of touched on the major ones, there's, I wouldn't dare to guess how many minor religions there are in the world, um, you know, it, it must go on and on. And I think what Andrew said when he started, it does seem to sort of fill some sort of um, human need here. And um, to get the history of where we are at the moment is um, really very useful and very, very interesting, I think. Could you please thank Andrew in the usual way? Thank you. Thank you.